Welcome to the Rookie Show. My name is Fahim. And my name is Nelly J, y'all. And we are Good Rookie. That's right. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Happy Good Tuesday. And guess what? It's the Good Rookie Show. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. What's going on, y'all? As you know, we're your host coming to you from Toronto, Canada, the six, and we bring to you the hottest topics in sports and culture, y'all. And this week, I mean, it ain't no different. So, hello. <laughs> so, first of all, Fahim, um, you know, we have had wow, this is going to be November the twenty twenty three is almost done, y'all. So, whatever y'all working on, like, get to it, okay? get to it real quick but as you know uh, Fahim I like to bring to you a couple of interesting trivia uh, questions and I think it's just fun because you learn things I learn things that I think th- 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 things that I, I would not have known if it wasn't for this trivia so can you tell me how many NBA players will have their own sh- current signature shoes laced up this NBA season Mm. How many players do you think got their own signature shoe? I'm going to go with 14. 14. That's that's your final answer? My final answer. Okay. Well, there are 26 NBA players (laughs) that will be lacing up. And Fahim, listen, okay, these names, I don't think you even know some of these guys have their own because I didn't know. And you're more of a sneaker guy than I am. Okay. But let me just start off with things like Puma, right? Puma got two players with their own shoes this coming mm-hmm. season. Oh, um, the Mellow Ball. Right. And and, oh, right. Okay. Yep. Knew that. Okay. Yeah. Then mm-hmm. we got Lee Ning. Lee mm-hmm. Ning. That's mm-hmm. CJ McCollum and Jimmy Butler. No clue. CJ McCollum has a shoe, y'all. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another shock there. And then, of course, we got Jordan, which you can think of, Zion, Luca, Jason Tatum. First yeah. of all, I didn't know Jason Tatum had a Jordan was a Jordan like a Jordan brand guy. No clue. Mm-hmm. Maybe you knew oh, before yeah. me. Didn't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Wiggins will have his own signature shoe with Peak. Any thoughts for him? Were you aware? Uh, yeah, I did hear about the Wiggins Peak. Um, I wasn't familiar with Peak. Obviously, not a big brand. Uh, Andrew Wiggins has a shoe, not really surprising due to the fact that I feel he, he got his first all-star by the help of, um, remember the, was it the Korean pop K-pop? They really, oh, yes. him, right. Um, so I don't know where peak is. Continue with your list. Let me look into okay. this and see what peak is. I'm thinking okay. might be out in that area. Go ahead. So we got Anta, Anta. Uh, Clay Thompson, Gordon Hayward, and Kyrie Irving. All three will have their own shoes this yeah. season. Uh, of course, New Balance, Kawhi, um, Rigorer, Rigorer, y'all. Did not even know that was a shoe. Uh, Austin <laughs> Reeves will have his own <laughs> shoe. Yes, this. I did see that also. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, guys, excuse my ignorance, y'all. Y'all know I'm not a sneakerhead, so, you know, don't charge it on to my heart, right? Just to my head. Uh, 361, apparently, is a true company. 361. Um, that's Aaron Gordon and Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, Curry brands. Of course, Steph, Steph Curry under Under Armour. I know that. And, of course, the last two, Adidas. Um, they got James Harden, Damian Lillard, Donovan Mitchell, Trey Young, and Anthony Edwards. And then Nike got LeBron James, Giannis. Kevin, KD, John Morant, and Devin Booker has a shoe? All right, y'all. Those are the 26 that I listed off that's going to have their own signature shoe this NBA season. Fahim, any shock here? Any shockers there? I got a, I got a few. <laughs> um, yeah, I just have one. Uh, the only shocker would be, I guess, Spencer Dinwiddie. <laughs> yep. Having a shoe. <laughs> He's one, but I'm not really surprised because he had a deal. This is maybe around the pandemic time, he had a deal on the table. Uh, he tried to do something creative, something to do with Bitcoin, I remember, something along those lines. So um, him having a shoe, like, 
really it is a surprise that he has a shoe but not really a surprise because he was always trying to have his own brand uh that's how they position this that's probably the biggest shocker and before you get to yours really quick uh, nelly j i just want to mention yes peak sports is a chinese uh sportswear company so that okay. would make sense why wiggins would actually have it over there because he's he's got he's got traction over there nelly peak. j He's peak over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'm just shocked about the Le Le Ning peak and 361 and Rigorer. Shock number one, I, those four shoe companies had no clue they existed, y'all. No clue. Like, did not even know. Wow. So, Never yet. number one Never shocker. Yet. All mm -hmm. combined. And all the players under those brands I'm shocked about. So, CJ McCollum having a shoe. Jimmy Butler yeah. having a shoe, no. But it being a B leaning, that's Jimmy Butler. He's such a random guy. I'm not surprised he's un not under the main ma the major brands. I'm mm -hmm. sure those guys probably approached him for him, and he's probably said no for some whatever reason. So Jimmy having a shoe, okay, I'm cool with that. But leaning, I didn't even know he had a shoe there. Uh, mm -hmm. Aaron Gordon, I know he can dunk, but really, he gets a shoe, okay. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, he gets a shoe. Austin Reeves, okay. Like those, I mean, Austin Reeves, I'm not because I think Austin has a following. This they say he's like the you know the 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 regular guy you know that that has a look of a regular dude, but plays really good basketball, right? Um, yeah. but Aaron Gordon, Spencer Dinwiddie, I don't, I didn't know. I mean, I know Aaron Gordon's a great dunker, so like no Zach, like I don't know. Anyway, I'm just shocked about all those brands having those brands being a brand <laughs> and those players. Um, having a shoe, I think for me, I'm actually impressed with Adidas's uh lineup. They have uh Anthony Edwards and Trey Young, both up and coming stars. That's big signing, you know, big signing mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think, and of course Nike got the John Moran, Devin Booker. Th those are the young the, the young stars rising, and of course Luca and, and uh, Zion with Jason Tatum and, and Jordan. So all those guys, young stars coming up gonna probably be you know you know gonna get better every year but no. puma lamello and scoot low key fahim if they can build on top of that they could also be a leader um and get some better players so yeah um that is our signature shoe trivia questions y'all again nice. i was shocked I, I hope you were shocked too for you and the guys yeah. listening and watching because yeah. <laughs> i had no good clue <laughs> good lead good lead um nelly j so they're the nba uh, Adam Silver had just spoken. Uh, he'd mentioned that they're looking for a possible expansion possibilities. Listed three teams. Now, before getting to these teams, uh, he did actually clarify that later to say okay. that these are not the final three teams. Yes. Uh, these teams are nothing more than teams that have reached out to the NBA and showed express for expansion. Yeah. Uh, meaning, um, Adam Silver, they have no ranking over anything, anything else. They just, he's just let people know, hey, these teams have reached out and we are not looking for expansion now. When we do, these three teams will be included, plus the others who actually put in their bid because they want to make it even. So I just want, I, when I first saw this list, I thought these were maybe the three final teams, but he gave, oh, okay. he gave clarification to it. So, um, but it's still interesting uh, due to the fact that two of them happen to be from our home. Net home, native Country? land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Home. Home. Our home, the dog. Our home. Home on, home on native land. Oh, Remember, yeah, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> our right. home on native land. Yep, that's right. And right, so, the three teams that Adam Silver had mentioned was Mexico City, Vancouver, and Montreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what's first crazy? I was in a debate with someone. I forgot who. Um, on Clubhouse about this because I really felt that I knew for sure the next two will be Vegas and Seattle, right? We're not crazy. We we know that. that that's been <laughs> in the books. Like, everyone knows that. But after that, I've been saying Mexico City um, with, of course, uh, I'll say Vancouver, Montreal. They've had sports teams, have them done really well economically-wise. The people there don't support sports teams like they need to, right? If you want to keep a team, you got to go out and buy tickets and go to games and create, you know what I mean? Like, they mm -hmm. didn't do that. They had baseball. They had other teams. They lost all those teams. So, again, I've never been – Um, I've, I'm, I've been pro Montreal getting a team, but the the, the folks there got to support it. That's the only way it's going to stay. But um, 
but Mexico City before Montreal, personally, respectfully. Um, and how about and Vancouver, Vancouver for how, sure. How about um, you say Mexico City over Montreal? How about Mexico City over Vancouver? Ooh, I th I think those are tied for me, close. Because mm, okay. I think Vancouver, the prem for a team, we know they had one. The f I think if a team goes back, it's going to be madness, and they're going to have a great support, um, and fan base. But Mexico City is probably, I think, way more popular than Vancouver in terms of money wise. We know their soccer team does really well. We know they've had college games there that do really well. They had, I think, FIBA, um, you know, camps. They've had a lot of basketball. I know someone who went there for a training camp for Team USA and, you know, tournaments there. So they're primed. I, and they have a G League, right? I think too. So they're primed and prepped. So yeah, like, I, I, I think. Mexico and Vancouver for sure automatic. Montreal, uh, I mean, let me let me see the paperwork. Let me see the paperwork. <laughs> yeah, see yeah, the paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> but I <laughs> if I'm an owner, I want to see the paperwork first before, you know what I mean? But Vancouver, Mexico City, hands down, yes, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. Montreal, I'm not mad at it. My my concern is the fans in Quebec. Will they go to games and is basketball a sport that they're going to support? I don't know. The folks that are black and brown there, hell yeah. But they're they're gonna need the other folks that aren't black and brown to support the team, and basketball has to be you know a, a, um, a favorite, right? Like basketball grew with the Raptors, and as we won and we got better, a, a GM helped it grow within the organization. I think Vancouver won't need that. Montreal will need some programs in place to grow that there. But from what I've been told, since I would say two thousand and ten. Basketball has grown a lot in Montreal. You know, they, they've they kind of given out Lou Dort, Ben Matherin. Like, these are products, uh, Chris Boucher of Montreal. So, you know, um, let's see. Let's see, right, if they're ready now to support a team. But, yeah, I mean, so your, uh, the fact on, that he brought it up, it's pretty dope, too, mm -hmm. that he brought it up. On your point about Montreal and having, uh, like, starting to have, a, a, like, a culture and maybe some infrastructure there, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to mention, they just last year – got a CEBL team, team the Montreal. I, I remember Lions, that. Right? Yep. And those games were so, empty too. Those games right. were very empty from what I saw in the videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I mean, the that science. is a start, but you're right. Um, I don't know if they, I don't know how their attendance was, but I mean, uh, the CEBL, the Canadian Elite Basketball League, um, you know, it's not like the NBA where you're talking, you know, 20, mm. 25,000 seat arenas. Uh, you're talking close to the 5,000. And uh, you'd hope... Ideally, if you're Montreal, that you can get an overflow in the summer, like selling out of that 5,000 seat arena. Um, but uh, for Vancouver, out of Vancouver and Mexico City, for me, I think Mexico City, if I was mm -hmm. the person, I'd do that just off the fact that um, if you are looking to grow the game globally, um, Mexico, leaving the continent, or sorry, leaving the country and to another one in the continent makes sense. Much like with, uh, with Canada, we have we're leading the league. He was mentioning of, uh, I think it's twenty six Canadian players we have now in the NBA. Um, at the time when we had, uh, before we had a team, Canadian players were making the NBA, but it was just very sparingly. One, two here, just we didn't have a presence, right? Yeah. So, ideally, who knows? Who knows what can happen? You put a team in in, uh, in Mexico City. Uh, right now, I don't think there's very much well, Mexican players in the in the NBA. But if you put a team there, make it part of the culture, grow the game there, then maybe who knows? You know, you could be talking fifty years down the road, and you know, you have a lot more Mexicans playing. Uh, in yeah, the NBA. you know, what I'm saying so. I, I, I'm I'm definitely I'll go Mexico City. I go. Then Vancouver, nothing against Vancouver. They had a chance before, um, and you you hit the nail on the head. It was just maybe a timing thing. Um, it just didn't work out. Um, yeah. I think yeah, they do. It, the timing is better for it now in much in Vancouver. Sorry, um, but they got some tough competition. So I think it go for me. I go much uh, Mexico City, Vancouver, and then lastly uh, Montreal. Yeah, I, I'm mad at that. I'm not mad at that. Mexico City, um, they have a lot of people. <laughs> freaking populated yeah. vancouver and montreal aren't even as big as those, that city so in terms of mm -hmm. economics making money attendance because again the goal is to get people through the doors right mm -hmm. so once you get through the doors that's how you make your money and so mm -hmm. where does the where does the nba revenue come from right and again a, a big chunk of it right 
after media Fahim, the biggest chunk of it is general seating, just attendance alone. So Are you serious? Yeah, so um they broke it down. This was by let me make sure I get the source. Um Forbes broke down like the revenue, right? So the revenue rose six percent this past season, right? So the average revenue for a team is three hundred and fifty three million. That's revenue, not profit revenue, right? That's outside of like so three fifty three mm-hmm. million per team. That's the average revenue, right? We all know Knicks, Warriors, Lakers are probably freaking double that. But mm-hmm. the average is that. So when you break down the pie of what it's broken down into, 50% of revenue for teams is media. 50%. Right? Now, think about the media for Mexico City. It's the country. The media for Vancouver, they have a stronger media. Montreal media, okay. Again, they're going to have to have a support, right? Advertising. That's all media, right? People go, like, it's all a part of it. Then the second highest is general seating 16.53 percent revenue comes from general seating and that is my issue with montreal i don't know if they have it in the biggest arena there how much people will be attending those games right. and that's why to your point mexico city is a great choice and vancouver right vancouver attendance wasn't the greatest either um so and we know that a lot of uh, uh vancouver fans do go watch i mean they probably will support seattle when they open up right um first mm-hmm. but that will be the kicker for us, right? General yeah. seating. But we know uh, that Vancouver has other sports teams that do well, right? So um, let's see how it goes. But yeah, that's the biggest chunk. And then after after general seating, uh, second, third is premium seating. Then it's um, other, which includes various types of uh, merchandise and so forth, concessions, parking, right? All that um, merchandise. And then the last revenue is um, arena sponsorship or advertising. So that's the pie. So when we think about the economics or what makes an NBA team successful, those five pieces, the second highest is general seating, right? And the media, strong media coverage, strong media support, right? Um, That will actually want to show your team on on TV, right? Um, Right. We know TSN and you know Sportsnet. They're in Toronto base, so will we watch Montreal games? If we're if we're feeling beat for real, if Montreal has the team, are we watching? Are we watching those games in Toronto? No, we're not watching those games. We're we're really not. Vancouver, we're not watching those games either, right? We're not. We're just not going to do it. Do that if they're playing Toronto or they're playing Toronto, either team will watch it. But I'm not watching Montreal's basketball team because they're in Canada. I'm a Toronto Raptor fan. You know what I'm saying, Fahim? So. It's going to be a little bit sticky, but that'll be a problem for those who live in Montreal and those who live in Vancouver, right? For us in Toronto, we're, we're good. We're straight. <laughs> right. well, also, but I, I just think it's going to be interesting when those teams open up, how, how, like, will fans leave Raptors to go be a fan there? Like, how is it going to work? So, I mean, we'll see. But nonetheless, those areas are primed for it. But general seating, I question Montreal, man. They lost the baseball team. Man. So, we'll see. Montreal is also five hours away from Toronto. So uh, relatively speaking, if you look at the map, they're pretty much our next... Rival? Biggest, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're our, as a city, they're pretty much our neighbor. They're very close. Yeah. And know? our rival yeah. for like hockey too. NHL, we, yeah. know, we know how it is. Canadians versus so, the Leafs. Mm-hmm. I think it, they're probably better. Vancouver, there's a lot of separation. So if you're not going to have yeah. one team in Canada... Yeah, spread it out. So, but I think of the two of them, I at the end of the day, I don't know if either one of them is going to get it. Tell you the truth, I think it's probably going to, like you mentioned before, the Seattle, the Vegas, is the Mexico City. Oh, those two are next up. Yeah, yeah, yeah no I'm doubt. Sorry. After that, though, the next two, I think Mexico City should for sure should be there, and I, I think Vancouver should get one too. I do think so, nice. but not Montreal. Sorry, uh, <laughs> SGA and it's not SGA, but Lou Dort and those guys who are saying, yeah, much have a team, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's nice <laughs> i swear people will be like yo y'all hating on montreal we're not hating on montreal y'all we just no no no, no i mean bonjour, bonjour. like the economics man mm-hmm. again all i want to see is the paperwork y'all paperwork let me know <laughs> let me know let me know <laughs> uh, all right nelly j let's go there for the culture for the culture we like to highlight individuals for the culture and today y'all we get to highlight um, something that I think is really amazing when it comes to 
um, black success, black Woo! excellence, and empowering black communities. So, the Black Farmer Fund, um, that's a community led investment fund um, that is for black owned agriculture and food businesses. They recently announced, and thanks to Because of Them We Can on Instagram, they recently announced that they have raised $11 million wow. thus far. And the goal is to reach 20 mil so that they can help empower black communities, foster a stronger, more inclusive food system. And we know, Fahim, food is going to be the next war. I really think food, what you're eating, the fact that, you know, we used to have, even in Canada, we used to have a lot of black farmers in Alberta, um, especially in, in Midwest of Canada. I'll call it Midwest, like we're, we're in the States, but, you know, the middle Western part of Canada. And we lost it in the Great Depression, right? And so a lot of those guys had to sell their farms because of Great Depression and move into the cities where they experienced a lot of racism in Edmonton and those cities in Calgary, right? Um, and you name it. And so we lost our farming thumb in the Black community. Therefore, we don't have control over or have our own, you know, need for food, right? Growing our own food and eating healthier. You know what I'm saying? It shows that, a lot of these, you know, eggs and milk in, you know, black and brown communities, the, the quality is lower versus eggs and milk in predominantly white communities. Right. It's been shown. Um, so I'm just really happy that this is something I think it's very different. Uh, something that's must that's needed. And I think if we can help fund black farmers, that's how we entice more people for him to farm. Right. To farm. And for black communities to have their own farming system within their community and have to rely on buying, you know what I mean? Buying from, let's say, predominantly white companies. If they can farm their own foods and vegetables, now we can buy those those items from black farmers and then, you know, help within our community itself. So I love this. I think it's really great. If you want to support guys, you go to at, at Black Farmer Fund on Instagram. And on there, you can see more details as to where they are right now. These are for owners. Um, these are mostly government investment fund for people, for owners in New York and um, a New York area. So I'm wondering if maybe on this episode, we can say, hey, New York, I'm hoping other states, other communities across Canada and America, you know, latch on to this type of initiative. And we see more black farmer funds popping up. Because I love this type of, you know, initiative. So anyways, Fahim, mm -hmm. that's the uh, for the culture. What's your thoughts on the Black Farmer Fund and what they're trying to do? It's amazing. Uh, you actually answered my, my first question I was going to ask is where? Where is this mm -hmm. going to be? Uh, the fact that you said New York, when we see you, when you say New York, we obviously think New York City, um, you know, but New York has there's New the York State. state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the state is huge. Uh, so new, you know, they have the smaller uh, rural places around there, right? So, um, I'm actually a little surprised that it's New York first, to be honest, just because the fact that uh, New York has harsh winters, much like other places, right? I I would have thought if it was going to be, it might have been in a U.S. state that had an all year round warm climate, um, but I mean, the fact that it's starting in New York. Maybe that might be a, a good thing for the initiative because, uh, you know, as they say, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And, uh, you know, New York is a leader very much in things. So um, also, so I have another question. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to answer. Maybe we can kind of work through it together. Uh, so these are to help, uh, you know, black farmers uh, with their ownership, right? Um, do they know, is there any numbers in regards to black farmers uh, the trend of black farmers right now. Maybe mm -hmm. we can Google that first because that's going to actually help me maybe. Uh, when I yeah, grab. there's a definitely mm -hmm. increase in black mm -hmm. farmers for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm seeing now that on their Instagram, they promote other black farming type events, entrepreneurs and initiatives. Mm -hmm. So um, they do support them. Like they're trying to hire people now to help them um ensure that for those applying are you know it's compliant i know they had the 11th black annual black farmers urban gardeners and that was in uh philadelphia P pennsylvania right. you know philly okay. pa 
um, yep. you know, the tri-state area. So mm -hmm. this is going to definitely not, not only focus on New York, but because the investments are in New York right now, they are promoting and supporting any other initiatives. Um, I know they promoted through the food systems investment f forum that happened in Denver in September of this year. So again, this is definitely sparking a lot of interest, not only in New York, but they're going to support other investments, other funds that are going to be around the states and they're kind of all coming together. Now, the trend of black farming, the actual numbers, uh, let's see. They're saying right now only 100 farmers is black owning less than 5 million acres in a new documentary that PBS found. Um, and this was in July uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. So but black farmers efforts to reclaim lost land. That's something that U.S. farmers are trying to do. In 1910, 40 percent of U.S. farmers were black owning more than 16 million acres. And right. then now. According to the census, only a hundred farmers are black, mm. and only less than five percent. Like I mentioned right. before, this mm. is nineteen ten, before the Great Depression. So, like right. many others during the Great Depression, a lot of them were forced to sell. Um, I know, like in Canada, right? So, there's a documentary called "Gaining Ground: The Fight for Black Land," and it's about efforts on how black families and their efforts to reclaim their legacy and create generational wealth that they had so pretty dope that we're kind of talking about you know historically black uh, farmers being denied right Lo mm -hmm. loans uh delight support we know uh fahim in world war one and two in canada and the states they said hey if you fight in the war you come you come back we're giving you land that did not happen for a lot of people in nova scotia um and those who fought in the states right yep. black people who fought and stopped they'll get land when they came back to canada and america they were denied that mm -hmm. so i really hope that the families of those individuals that were not given that land they fight back and reclaim it um but in terms of the actual percentage there's only 100 right now black farmers in america uh so um and and, and the loan rate for black farmers is very low very very low so now having this fund right Fahim they can go to they, they can go to a black fund and actually get that loan to right. actually purchase land and acquire land and and create that type of the type of business for their family right so I think the black farmer black farmer fund is is huge huge amazing. For black it's amazing yeah. and it also covers not not just farming but even in regards to economics um, we know the system is not really, it's, it's hard for black people to get loans. There is, you know, yes. uh, not only they do with like credit scores and, and, but there's, there's things of uh, racism, uh, in the loan process also. Um, so at least, at least we know that if, uh, people are looking uh, to get into farming, uh, they have somewhere that uh, actually give them the opportunity um, and maybe not uh, turn them away. So yeah, it's amazing. Nelly J, great for the culture. Awesome. Thank you. And just to kind of leave some tidbits for those who are interested, please look into this. But they said U.S. Black farmers have lost $326 billion worth of land in the 20th century, according to a study. And this was, this was reported by Reuters, um, a study. So that's interesting, right? Three, imagine $326 billion was in the black community right now. And that was lost due to losing land um, in mm -hmm. the black community. Right. Yeah. And that was a study found that, which is, again, <laughs> when we talk about the system not really built for us, the land loss is a contributor to that racial wealth gap that we have in Canada and the U.S. where we know they had land and they lost yeah. it especially in the Boston Northeast area, right? For sure. Um, another study actually found that over the last three uh, agricultural census, consen censuses, has, it has been recorded that black farmers have increased, right? So there's more black farmers bec becoming black farmers, but the land owned and operated has decreased. Another issue. So we're losing land, right? We know land is value. Land is, land is more valuable than a lot of things. So... Uh, again, big up to the Black Farmer Fund, uh, yep. big up to all the funds that are kind of pushing this type of initiative and helping 
these black farmers get land and increase that, you know, that that wealth gap. Because we definitely need more black farmers in our community. Definitely. That's facts. That's facts. All right. So now, DJ, let's close this out with That's Absurd. That's Absurd. For him, bro. What was absurd this week? What was absurd? The Los Angeles Clippers. Lou Williams, who played for the Clippers with Kawhi and Paul George, was on a podcast. And Lou Williams had said that the Clippers stopped trying to win the championship in the bubble because they thought that people wouldn't respect the ring. And I'm going to give him the, I'll give you the direct quote of what he said. He said, we started to hear rumblings that nobody's going to respect this chip. So we kind of took our foot off the gas, end quote. Absurd. Absurd. This comes from a guy who got lemon pepper <laughs> wings. What was it what called? Was it lemon wings he got? Yeah, you got, it, you got lemon pepper wings. Yeah, you got <laughs> In the bubble. And went to the strip club to get it at all places. Not even didn't want to order it off on the phone because hey 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 guys can i order a lemon pepper wings he said no damn it i'm gonna go to the strip club and get it myself you think again and and what was funny for him he was talking about how much he loved toronto and it's like it's so crazy how you could say one thing that's so sweet and something that's so dumb you know so so dumb and i'm not calling him dumb he's the sixth man of the year he's a great player but what he said is dumb because there's no way for him and again I we all, we're, we both played sports, right? And I can imagine how crazy you are to be in the NBA to play a sport in that league. You have to be insanely great, gifted, right, to play in that league. You're gonna tell me that Kawhi Leonard and Paul George both were said were said. You know what? We're up three one against Denver. Ah, if we win one more game, it's not worth it because it's a bubble ring. You're not even a finals dog. Get get out of here. We watched. First of all, Mr. Williams, we watch basketball on this podcast. We watch it. We saw what happened. And it was not that. Uh, you played your, you played your, you put, your, everyone tried their hardest. But uh, Jamal Murray and and the uh, the finals MVP of this past season cooked, okay. cooked y'all like, like fried rice <laughs> with some eggs in there, stir up in there with some onions, peppers, with some real pepper, <laughs> hot pepper, your spicy pepper. So, Please, we watched that, man. Y'all got cook up. We saw Paul George, respectfully again, throwing a three-point attempt, hitting the side of the backboard yep. in the remaining minutes of that game seven. Please, sir, do not do not think we are ignorant to basketball and what, uh, what it entails. Everyone that team wanted to win. Y'all were upset after that game. Y'all were mad. And then even we all heard that um, a lot of mental health, mental challenges within the bubble, some of your players came out about that being an issue. You guys hired someone to actually strengthen that. We're not going to now say you guys didn't care to win. No, Fahim. I'm right. sorry. Go ahead, um, Fahim. You got sir. it. <laughs> Mine's quick. All I got is uh, if anybody, so I don't, obviously, I clearly don't believe it, but if anyone was <laughs> to have that, maybe Kawhi. Kawhi had that time. He's already had two rings, right? Um, you can't tell me that Lou Will, Lou Will doesn't have a ring. No. Um, Paul George doesn't have a ring. Exactly. Like you have people who don't have a ring and and are saying, you know what? Even if we get this ring, people won't respect it anyway. So let's not try. What are we what are we doing? <laughs> Absurd. <laughs> Absurd. This is scary okay. hours, man. You're getting tired <laughs> now, bro. Just just, just hold, hold the L. Y'all lost. Oh, yeah. You're up three one. You guys lost that final. Don't blame. Hey, well, we didn't really care. Get out of here. Get the yeah, hell out of here. A bubble <laughs> ring, a bubble ring is better than no ring, I'd say. Exactly. Yeah. Yo, I'll take listen, Bush player wouldn't want that bubble ring, man. Come on, get out of here. Yeah. All right, Nelly Nonsense. J. Let's put this episode in the books. Y'all, that was the good rookie show. Yep, yep. So y'all, as you know, let's do our, our quick shout outs. Mine is real quick. We spoke about um Howard you uh having a black golf team winning nationals back to back well a high school golf team of all black players became the first to win a state championship for him wow. and that's the state of georgia so big up to charles r drew public charter schools varsity boys golf team that clinched their state championship making it historic for, for first for both the school and the state of georgia 
very impressive big up to them that's my shout out bro real quick nice mine is uh there's a youtuber called mr beats or mr beast my apologies mr beast uh he's went around to africa different countries and he built a hundred wells amazing wow that's so amazing so you get, get this uh you know water uh clean water for you know could be millions uh, generations of uh i think there in kenya was one of the, one of the countries so shout out to youtuber uh, mr beast all right shout out let's put it in the books nelly j that was the good rookie show <laughs> So y'all, if you had a good time, you enjoyed yourself, please like and subscribe and help to tell two friends, Fahim. <laughs> On all platforms, if you're looking for us, that's a good rookie show. Here we have. Hey. Hey.